Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to this wonderful service, Calvary UPC Facebook. And uh, this is a wonderful day. The Bible teaches us that this is a day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Praise the Lord. Let's be glad today. Let's be happy. Let's worship. And uh, let's just enjoy this service today. A song comes to mind, and it goes like this. Thanks, thanks, I give you thanks for all you have done. I am so blessed, my soul has found rest, oh. soul has found rest, oh Lord, I give you thanks. Oh, let's give him thanks, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord, I'm so glad to be with you again for a time of praise and worship. Worship the Lord today, let's give him glory and honor. He's worthy, he's done great things, and he is doing great things. I'm excited about the word today, excited to worship with you. Bless you in Jesus' name. You are worthy of glory and honor. We magnify you. There is no one like you, Jesus. We bless your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Great are you, Lord.
worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. We welcome your presence to our homes, Lord. Into this atmosphere, God. Hallelujah. In this place, Lord. Jesus, be welcomed, Lord. I magnify you, Jesus. Hallelujah. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope, your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is up. In your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, it's what our hearts long for to be. Come in, Lord, and 
into our places of our homes, Lord, into our hearts, Lord, into our minds, God. We welcome your presence, Jesus. Be exalted, Lord. Blessed be your name. Thank you, Jesus. Greetings. Let me talk to you today about your trouble. I have a dear friend who often greets me with the phrase, here comes trouble. Well, I hope that that's not what he literally thinks of when he sees me coming. None of us like trouble. The simple words car trouble produces an incredible angst in all of us. Uh, before I go, let, let me thank so many of you at Calvary and beyond who have prayed for, supported our family, uh, during the promotion of my dad on to glory. Your words, your comments have meant a great deal. My father was truly an incredible Christian. Back to trouble. Trouble is something that none of us ever enjoy. An old spiritual that was written by a slave in pre-Civil War days is, is pretty well known. There are quite a number of uh, blues singers that have kind of adapted it in different ways, but it, it, it originally went something like this. Oh, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. And since it was spiritual, it went, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Oh, yes, Lord, I'm almost to the ground. Oh, yes, Lord. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. Nobody knows the trouble I have seen. Glory, hallelujah. Well, do, do you ever feel like that? Nobody knows the trouble I've seen should be your personal life anthem. Well, let's talk about trouble. In, in Joshua 7, trouble comes to Israel because of a gentleman by the name of Achan's disobedience. The Israelites had defeated and defeated in grand fashion under the guidance of the Lord, the city of Jericho. Jericho was quite a significant city. The next place that they needed to conquer was a small community by the name of Ai. And so instead of sending his entire army to conquer Ai, Joshua just sent a small portion of what he had available. Well, when they got to Ai, things did not go well. As a matter of fact, uh, they came back uh, licking their wounds. Thirty-six of their soldiers had been killed on the battlefield that day, and they had certainly not conquered Ai. Now, God had given instruction to the Israelites when they conquered Jericho that they were to take nothing of value. All of the valuables were to be used for God's purpose. And unbeknownst to Joshua and to all of Israel, in the conquest of Jericho, there was one man who disobeyed God's instruction. The fellow's name was Achan. And as they were going through the city of Jericho, Achan saw gold and silver as well as some expensive uh, clothing, and he, he, he just couldn't withstand it. He, he took those valuables and he hid them away in his tent. And so Achan's disobedience to God's word uh, resulted in significant trouble. Now, before I go on, let me just kind of put this in perspective. Achan was, number one, disobedient. And all of us who have been disobedient to parents at various times, particularly if we had good parents who took uh, the responsibility to discipline us and grow us into, into adults who were responsible, uh, we know that disobedience gets you into trouble. Well, well Achan was disobedient. He was disobedient to God. The second thing I notice in this is that Achan's disobedience was prompted by what he saw. Your eyes will get you in trouble. He saw gold, silver, and expensive garments. And it's no wonder that the New Testament warns us about 
the desire of the eyes. Your, have your eyes ever got you in trouble? You saw something that you wanted to buy, but it really didn't fit within your budget. Can, can I get a witness that your eyes can get you in trouble? Third thing I noticed is that Achan was impatient. Now, Wednesday night, Pastor Butler talked to us about the importance of faith mingled with patience. Achan did not have patience. He wanted to increase his wealth now. God's restraint against taking the plunder of a city was only regarding the city of Jericho. But Achan could not wait. He wanted it at this moment, at this season. So his impatience got him in trouble. So after Israel's defeat at Ai, a process was used to come to understand what had gone wrong. And it was determined in a matter of time that Achan was a culprit who had done something that was, that was improper. And the outcome, you can read it in Joshua chapter 7, was that Achan was stoned in the valley of Achor. And then that pile of stones was burned with fire. And so this pile of stones in this valley of Achor, not far from Jericho, becomes a temporary monument, if you please, to uh, to the folly of this man, Achan. Well, it's interesting that the word Achor, the name of the valley where Achan was stoned, the word Achor means trouble, not just a little trouble, but trouble that is serious, trouble that is extreme. Achor was a good name for that place. Anybody ever known serious and extreme trouble? Well, I'm talking to some just now who you are dealing with serious and extreme difficulties in your life. There is trouble, and it seems to be on every side. Achan's trouble. Achan's trouble resulted in him being stoned for his disobedience. Achan left behind a family that had no caretaker, had no provider. They had no one to come to their defense. Achan's failure, Achan's sin left trouble for Israel because they had been seen as invincible by all of the people who lived in Canaan, but now the small town of Ai has defeated them. And furthermore, 36 families of Israel have been left without a father, a husband, a, a caretaker, a provider. And so, so the trouble that came that day, the trouble that came lingered for coming decades. There would be uh, there would be years piled atop years and perhaps generation atop generation that would be affected by the trouble of that particular moment. And then, of course, there was the grief. And I can only imagine the, the, the horror of having to deal so stringently with the failure of one of their very own. So there's a pile of stones. When they had crossed uh, the Jordan River, they had to put uh, a pile of stones, and it was to be a memorial of God having brought them through. But this pile of stones, not instructed by God, but instead just just left there, a pile where that they had stoned Achan to death. It wasn't a monument to greatness, but it was a monument to folly. It was something that uh, was not to be quickly forgotten. It was a commemoration of trouble, and so far generations because it takes time for a pile of stones to be dispersed for generations that pile of stones in the valley of Achor would be used to remind youngsters of the trouble that came from disobedience trouble that had such an impact on a person a family and just as America is experiencing now with an unprecedented virus at least unprecedented in our lifetime. This particular trouble is affecting a nation, and yes, it is affecting the entire world. Trouble, trouble. You know nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. All of that was Achan's trouble. All of that was Achan's difficulty. I speak to someone today who you find yourself in a place of trouble, trouble of your own making, just as Achan's trouble was of his own making. 
Your trouble is not connected with the virus that has affected our world, but instead you have made decisions and you've stepped beyond the realm of the will of God with your life and you've chosen directions that have alienated you and they have caused you to be set apart from your family and from close friends and it's almost as though you have become a pariah in your community. You have become virtually a leper where that people see you and they try to keep their distance. And you find your spirit so very troubled and you find yourself rolling and tossing in the night and there is despair in your spirit and there is such an angst in your soul because you are troubled on every side. You have a despair and you have a woundedness in your life and in your heart and it's a constant thing. That is your life and that is your trouble. And so now you have your own valley of Achor. You have your own pile of trouble. I'm so glad that I can talk to you today about a God who, in the face of human failure, who in the midst of our despair, in the midst of the lackings that exist in you and in me alike, He is a God of mercy and He offers us salvation instead of destruction. Valley of Achor the valley of trouble. Well, that's obviously a notable time for the nation of Israel. It was a time of learning, a time of discovery that God meant what he said when he had given instruction and that there would be profound impact. They came to know trouble in a very personal way. Beyond that, the Bible does not often refer to the valley of Achor. Isaiah mentions it one time, and then the only other time is mentioned in the book of Hosea. When you read the book of Hosea, Hosea is a prophet who foretold what was going to happen to Israel. And he, his prophecy a number of times repeats a four-step cycle. Israel is sinful, living in idolatry. That's number one. And then God judged them for their folly and their judgment came through the destruction of crops or being enslaved by some other nation. Second step. Third step was Israel would be sorry for their sin and they would call on God in repentance. The fourth step, God would forgive and restore them to liberty and to a right relationship with them. The first prophecy about this four-step cycle is in the book of Hosea chapters 1 through 3. And God's prophetic promise to Israel in chapter 2 verses 14 and 15 reads like this, Therefore, behold, I, God, will allure. The word allure means entice. I, God, am going to entice her. And the hurry speaking of is Israel. And I'm going to bring Israel into the wilderness and I will speak comfortably unto her. Well, the Amplified Bible puts it that I will speak tenderly to her heart. Verse 15, And I will give her her vineyards from thence, and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. There it is, that, that same word, Achor. And the meaning is still the same. Achor equals serious and extreme trouble. But Inspired by God, Hosea is connecting trouble with hope. The valley of serious and extreme trouble is for Israel a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. God shows Hosea the valley of Achor. It's in a different light now. Serious and extreme trouble would become the door of hope. Uh, your trouble has you in a depth of despair. You feel such struggle. You feel such intimidation. There, there seems to be just a veil of impossibility. And you're, you're surrounded by a fog. It's, it's a pollution of, of just the struggle is something you can reach out and touch, and it's a tangible thing. Trouble, trouble, trouble. But could it be 
that your trouble in the grand scheme of life and in the grand scheme of eternity becomes a door, not a door of escape, but instead a door of hope. Such a door of hope that when you open that door and you walk through it, there is a song that is born in your spirit and in your heart and you sing as in the days of naive and innocent youth, as the days when Israel came out of Egypt. The serious and extreme trouble became the door of hope. Hope is a powerful thing. Hope is to desire something with the expectation of attainment. Desire with expectation. To be hopeless is to desire with no expectation of attainment. There's an odd connection there. Serious and extreme trouble as the door of hope. But I've watched this happen over and over in people's lives where they find themselves at the end of their tether and at the end of the rope. They feel that they can't go one step further. But in spite of all of that, God leads them to a place where that they are guided and they're instructed and they follow his path and they follow his pattern and they, they, they decide that they will follow him as intensely and intently as they have lived for the world and as they have done their own thing. You see, your trouble can result in, in several different things. You can build a shanty of a building, you can homestead in the midst of your trouble or your trouble can become something that that you allow to percolate through your life, a constant memory, and, and the result will be a bitterness that is born of your trouble or of your valley of Achor with its pile of stones that are a disturbing memory of unforgettable trouble. Trouble for you and trouble for your family and trouble for all that surrounds you, it can become a door of hope and not just a door of hope to you, it can become a door of hope to your family. It can become a door of hope to your friends. And so which are you going to let it be? Are you going to let your trouble become a place where you homestead for the rest of your life? And every conversation has this injected into it, the trouble that you went through in 2020 or 2019 or something that began in 2013. Or, or, or are you going to let this just inwardly bounce through your life over and over again to the point that you are bitter. It's a quiet, silent bitterness, but it eats away at the insides. Or will you let your trouble become a door of hope? You're without hope right now, aren't you? But God wants to offer you hope. Pastor, I'm in trouble beyond what can be imagined. Well, I've stood in the pulpit. I preached to men sitting right over there who had just been declared guilty of murder and were out temporarily. Is that your story? God saved that man sitting over on that front pew on the left side wearing his ankle bracelet. Which are you going to let it be? Pastor, you, you, you don't know. You, you just don't know what distress my marriage is in. You, you, you don't understand. But you see, there's something bigger than all of those things. If you can get your life in, in, in right relationship with God, which is what Israel needed, then God is able to bring you and use your trouble as a door of hope. Well, why, why can trouble be a door of hope? Well, it, it causes us to realize that something's amiss. It brings us to a place of in, introspection. And so let me ask you this. You've done your own thing. Has it worked? Has it worked for you? Or are you doing okay financially? Are you doing okay mentally? Or, or are your children moving forward? Is are things looking up for you? Has it worked? Has it worked? If you seem to bounce from one trouble to the next, 
Could it be that you're making bad choices one right after the other? And you can't seem to get off the treadmill of hopelessness. And it's simply because that you live in a way that invites trouble. I don't want to take too much of your time, so let me quickly travel to another place where a man found himself in trouble. And all of this is found in, in Acts chapter 16. In the city of Philippi, two itinerant evangelists, their names Paul and Silas, have been arrested and beaten. And the jailer put them in stocks in the deepest part of the prison. Well, at midnight, the two evangelists prayed and they sang praises to Jesus and, and, and an earthquake came. And it opened the gates, it loosed the bonds, not just of the two preachers, but it loosed everybody's bonds, opened everybody's gates. All of the prisoners were set free. Well, this series of events was trouble in all caps. I started to say with a capital T, but it was, it was trouble in all caps for the jailer. He was, you see, he was responsible for securing the prisoners, and he supposed... The Bible says that all the prisoners had escaped, and under the government of the time, the jailer faced a death sentence for his incompetence at allowing this group of prisoners to escape. So when the jailer saw the prison doors open, he perceived himself to be in serious trouble. And so in response to his trouble, this jailer, we'll later discover, a family man, he drew his sword with the intent of killing himself. And out of the darkness, Paul shouted, Do thyself no harm. We're all here. The jailer lit a light, and he came to Paul and Silas, and he had one question. What must I do to be saved? Trouble? Suicide? And now, what must I do to be saved? He has realized that in spite of the trouble he's in, he begins to imagine that there is a hope beyond his trouble. What do I need to do to be saved from my trouble? And because he perhaps recognized that these men had preached an unusual message in his community, he, what do I need to do to be saved from my spiritual condition? To be saved means something or someone is it great risk. The child is saved from drowning. What do I need to do to be saved? And their simple answer entered a territory with which the jailer was not familiar. Their simple single answer sentence at that moment dispelled the jailer's hopelessness. Their answer invited the jailer to faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He invited them and they spoke to him the word of the Lord. And after he heard the word of the Lord, what do you suppose they spoke to him? They spoke, number one, I believe, about the Messiah and what that Messiah was going to do and bring. And secondly, they talked about Israel not accepting this Messiah that finally came. And they presented that Jesus was the Christ. He heard the word of God. And he believed the word of God. The jailer's belief caused him to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remitting of his sins and his household, his wife, his children, and perhaps others were baptized in the same way. The Philippian jailer had come to his own acor of extreme trouble. Matters were so serious that he had decided to take his own life, but his acor becomes his door of eternal hope. How did this happen? Well, still surrounded by trouble, and despite his trouble, the jailer listened to the Word of God, and he heard about the Messiah, and that this one would break chains and heal and bring peace to troubled lives, and he came to understand that Jesus was that Christ, that he was the Messiah. He accepted, he understood, he believed all of that, and then Paul and Silas would say to him, and instruct him about the next steps. And in response to their instruction, the jailer would have repented. Now that's not expressed, but it does say he was baptized in repentance 
in the scripture was always a preceding event to being baptized. And so they were baptized. And so trouble became a place for the Philippian jailer to experience hope. The earthquake was trouble. Prison gates opened, trouble. Preparing for suicide, trouble, time and eternity. The phrase, what must I do to be saved, expresses that he recognizes he is in a condition where he needs salvation. What must I do to be saved from my trouble? If I could just get you to have that same idea come to your mind, what must I do to be saved from my trouble? What do I need to do to be brought from my despair? What do I need to do to be brought from this shanty place I built in my valley of hopelessness and trouble? Well, I could offer you a simple tried answer, but I won't. What I will do is tell you that the jailer was told what an outcome would be if he believed. At that point, in the bowels of the prison, he didn't know enough to believe. And you may be in a similar situation and in such trouble looking for a way to be saved, but you don't know a whole lot about God and the things of God. And I'm, I'm not interested in you just taking my word and take, take action, but there came a time when he, he knew enough, he understood enough that he could believe. And Paul and Silas spoke to him and to his household the word of the Lord. There are two things I want to lay before your troubled mind today. First is this. If you already know, then today repent. If you're a backslider, repent. Backslider or one who knows much about God and the things of God and you felt the Spirit of the Lord and you could quote many verses of the Scripture, repent of your sins, repent of the anti-God things that are in your life. You're a thief and you're a liar and you're immoral, it's time for a change. It's produced nothing but trouble. If you've not been, then go beyond repentance and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the washing away of, of your sin and receive the Holy Spirit in your life. If, on the other hand, you're like the Philippian jailer and you really don't have the foundation of knowledge to take the proper steps and and to really understand even what you're doing about being saved, ask for a personal Bible study. We have a number of trained teachers at Calvary, and uh, we can do these currently online if we must. And, and we can show you the path to salvation. We can teach you about the Messiah, and we can teach you about who Jesus is and what Jesus will do in your life. And so send a message or even a note just below. The valley of serious and extreme trouble as your door of hope. Find yourself there today. Why not take this opportunity to discover what Israel certainly came to learn? That trouble does not have to be synonymous with hopelessness. That trouble does not have to end in a funeral dirge or singing the blues for the rest of your life, but you can sing the songs of youth, the songs of celebration, the songs of innocence. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Well, guess what? That Jesus wants to help you. He wants to bring you from your trouble to hope and for you to serve him with the same intensity that you have lived for yourself. Let me pray for you today. Then I want to talk about the fact of our services having reopened. And then Tina is going to come with a song where that she's going to communicate to you from another angle, what it is that Jesus can do in your life and what he will do. Lord Jesus, you know my audience today. There's a portion of this preparation that you, you just advised me. I began to fill in the blanks and kind of convey in preparation what, 
what I was going to talk about in regard to people's trouble. But it seemed that you advised me just to leave that part blank and to let you prompt me as I came to that part of the message today. And so, Lord, I trust you. You know who's in this audience, and you know who will watch us today, and you know who will watch this week or even a year from now. You know what's going on in their life. I'm asking in the name of Jesus Christ that every hindering spirit, every obstructing thing that would stand in the way of the Spirit of God accomplishing something in someone's life, that it would be set aside. I pray, Lord, that the person who is on the treadmill of trouble and hopelessness would recognize in a moment, in a time, in a season of introspection that it doesn't have to always be this way, that there are others who are certainly having a better outcome of life and let them look at the people that are in God's church and come to recognize the Lord is able to do something very special and very real in their own world. I appeal to you on this, on this day that you give great revival and transform lives. Open the door to home Bible studies. Prepare us for the moment. In Jesus' name, so be it. Glory to God. Well, as you may perhaps know, we have reopened our services. They're really small groups because currently in Springfield, we can only have 24 people gathering at a time. Uh, earlier today, we had our first series of services, and, and uh, we anticipate, we had three today, we anticipate continuing to add more in spite of the fact that a number of our uh, sick folk, a number of people who are a bit elderly, a number of people who... Uh, whose immune systems are not uh, particularly strong, they are not able to be with us. And I don't advise them or any of you who are in that situation to come. But next Sunday, again, at 9 o'clock, 1045, 1230, and if necessary, even later, including the possibility of Saturday night, we will have more opportunities for you to come and worship with us and be in church. So uh, there's a registration that we use on Facebook. Take advantage of that. You can reserve, I, I guess the best way to call it is you can reserve tickets that uh, you use and um, if there are five in your family you can have five places to sit. And of course we're, we're keeping several spaces available for those who would be our guests. So if at the last minute something comes free and you're able to come be with us at Calvary then we invite you to come on and, and worship, praise God with us, and let your life be changed and let God begin to bring you from the trouble as you walk through the door into a place of hope. Worship the Lord and let the Spirit of God continue to draw you as Tina sings today. If the ship of your life is tossing on the sea of strife, you need someone. If you feel so all alone and your house is not a home, you need someone. If it seems life isn't fair And there's no one left to share All those lonely days and nights And things just won't turn out right You want someone to care And someone to just be there You need someone Hi. 
I give you Jesus. He is the perfect love that casteth out all fear. Oh, I give you Jesus. He's the water that you'll drink and never thirst again. I give you give you Jesus. If the pressure's all around, keep your spirits to the ground. You need someone. And if your body is in pain and your health you can't regain, you need someone and if the times that you have tried with all the strength you had inside and it seems that you have failed remember on the cross he nailed all the bitterness and grief to give you peace and sweet relief he is that someone that you need, so I give you Jesus. Jesus. He's the peace that passes all understanding. I give you Jesus. Jesus. He's the perfect love that passes. He's everything you need. I give you Jesus. Oh, my friend. I give you Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.